When we left the Battle of Open Knob, Confederate Brigadier General George Manny's successful attack saw Lieutenant Charles Parsons being drugged off the field of battle by his own fleeing men. Manny's men washed over Open Knob like a huge wave of water. Brigadier General William R. Terrell's 33rd Brigade was decimated because of his orders to mount a failed bayonet charge. Now the Union troops are on the run. They will attempt to meet up with the 28th Brigade of Colonel John C. Starkweather with Manny's Confederate troops in hot pursuit through a cornfield. This assault would be considered the most crucial action of the Battle of Perryville and would ultimately decide the fate of the Confederate Heartland Offensive in the state of Kentucky. All aboard the Kentucky Tennessee Living Time Machine! Please fasten your seatbelts and keep your arms and legs inside of the vehicle at all times. But to get going, we need your help. We still need to fire up that time machine to transport us. Please help us by clicking on the like, subscribe, and bell notification buttons down below. Not only does this fire up the time machine for our flight back in time, but it convinces the YouTube algorithm that we need a bigger vehicle to reach more people who love history as much as you do. Now. Back to our story. Starkweather's 21st Wisconsin in a Cornfield Colonel John C. Starkweather was in command of 2,200 men in the 28th Brigade of Rousseau's division and 12 guns. While Manny was attacking Parsons' position on Open Knob, Starkweather placed his 21st Wisconsin in a cornfield that would act as a buffer should the Confederates break through the line. But the 21st had huge issues. The troops were mostly comprised of inexperienced men, some of whom had never fired their weapons before. The regiment had been formed less than a month earlier. And, to add to the issues, was that the cornfield had stalks that were 10 to 12 feet high, or 3.7 meters high. This made the oncoming Confederate troops hard to see. The 21st was in their positions when they were surprised by Terrell's brigade that was in full retreat. Imagine standing at the ready when all of a sudden the regiments of the 33rd Brigade came running full speed through the line without a warning. Brigadier General William R. Terrell also ran through the line while in retreat screaming, quote, The rebels are advancing in terrible force, unquote. Quickly, Terrell was able to convince the regimental adjutant to order another bayonet charge through the cornfield. 200 men advanced and were quickly smashed by the oncoming Confederates. The Union troops had to hold their fire because they were trying to avoid shooting their retreating comrades. However, Starkweather's batteries rained down artillery fire that caused a lot of friendly fire casualties. The 21st was able to fire a volley into the Confederate ranks. But the Confederates answered this with a 1,400 musket volley that destroyed the Union Regiment. The survivors of this volley fled toward the Benton Road. Brigadier General Alexander P. Stewart and the 1st Tennessee There was a gap in the Confederate line where Brigadier General Daniel S. Dodson's brigade had fought. Major General Benjamin F. Cheatham deployed the 1st Tennessee under the direction of Brigadier General Alexander P. Stewart. Stewart was to take the brigade and join with Manny's brigade and advance towards Starkweather. The 1st Tennessee attacked the northern end of the hill. The remainder of Manny's brigade charged directly up the slope. It seems that Starkweather's position was stronger than anticipated. The Confederate first attack was repulsed by Starkweather's infantry and artillery fire. Not to be denied, the Confederates reorganized their line and attacked for a second time. This charge was vicious, and the Confederates used hand-to-hand -hand combat to reach the crest among the Union batteries. Here is a report that was given by Private Sam Watkins, 1st Tennessee. It states the following, Quote, the guns were discharged so rapidly that it seems that the earth itself was in a volcanic uproar. The iron storm passed through our ranks, mangling and tearing men to pieces. The very air seemed full of stifling smoke and fire, which it seemed the very pit of hell, 
peopled by contending demons, unquote. The West Ridge At 4.15 that evening, Brigadier General Terrell returned to the fight. He was leading his troops up the reverse side of the slope from Starkweather's position. An artillery shell exploded over his head and mortally wounded him. Terrell would die from his injuries at 2 a.m. the following morning. Because of the deaths of Brigadier General Jackson, Brigadier General Terrell, and Colonel George Webster, Colonel Albert S. Hall rose to the ranks to be in command of the 10th Division by the end of the battle. At the same time, Starkweather was able to save six of his 12 guns and move them 100 yards or 91 meters west to the next ridge. At this point, the Union forces had a strong defensive position. It seems that there was a stone wall at the top of this steep sloped ridge and Starkweather was able to maintain his artillery support. Manny and Stewart attempted three unsuccessful assaults against the Union positioned on the ridge. After the third attempt, Stewart and Manny withdrew their men to Open Knob at 5.30 p.m. While this was the bloodiest and most crucial part of the battle for Perryville, the fighting was not over. There were other battles yet to fight. In next week's video, we will discuss the battle for Loomis Heights. Thank you. Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for watching our video series on the Appalachian Civil War battles. Don't forget to hit that like button as the more likes we receive, the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. Also, to receive notice when we upload a new video, be sure to subscribe and click the bell notification button. Please double check that you are subscribed as some of our viewers are finding that they are no longer subscribed to our channel. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we are discovering the mysteries in Appalachian history.